Another prediction of evolutionary theory is the existence of transitional forms. That is, species possessing characteristics of both what they evolved from and what they evolved into. If all life evolved from a common ancestor, then transitional species would have to exist for each fork in the evolutionary tree. They wouldn't be easy to find, since a speciation event often occurs with just a very small population over a geologically short period of time, and fossilization is exceedingly rare, but transitional species must exist. When Darwin published his seminal work on the origin of species in 1834, he lamented the lack of any known transitional fossils, but he predicted they had to exist if evolution is true. Sure enough, two years later the first transitional fossil was discovered. Named Archaeopteryx, it was a transitional form between dinosaurs and birds. It possessed the bony tail, clawed fingers, toothed jaws, and snout characteristic of theropod dinosaurs as well as the wings, flight feathers, hollow bones, and wishbone characteristic of birds. While likely not the direct ancestor of modern birds, Archaeopteryx is nevertheless a perfect example of a form transitioning from one type of species into another. Fossilization is an extremely rare process since it requires rapid burial in sediment-filled water, creating an oxygen-free environment that preserves hard parts, like bones and teeth, long enough to gradually replace with minerals. This means that the great majority of fossils are marine organisms and that more than 99% of species are never fossilized, and finding those relatively few fossils in the narrow window between being exposed and eroding away is even more rare. Yet despite those limitations, since Darwin's time we have discovered many hundreds of transitional fossil species, including those showing the transition of reptiles into mammals, reptiles into dinosaurs, dinosaurs into birds, land mammals into whales, and much more. Researchers have even been able to predict what previously undiscovered transitional species must have looked like and where they would have to be found in the fossil record. This is how Tiktaalik, a transitional form between lobe-finned fishes and four-legged land animals, was discovered. Researchers had already found the fossils of both lobe-finned fishes and the earliest four-legged land animals, which they then used to predict what a transitional form between them would look like, as well as where it would have to have lived and the age of the rock formations in which it would be located. They then went out and discovered Tiktaalik right where they had predicted. That's also how the many transitional forms between early apes and modern humans were discovered. Darwin himself predicted that humans must have originated in Africa because of our similarities to chimpanzees and gorillas. Sure enough, paleontologists exploring Africa have since found numerous fossil species with physical characteristics between early apes and modern humans, all within the right range of dates, exactly what evolutionary theory predicted we should find. You couldn't ask for better demonstrations of the predictive power of evolutionary theory than these examples. So what would creationism predict? Well, if all species were created basically in their current form, there would be no need for the existence of transitional species at all. In fact, their existence would make no sense and it would be impossible to predict their existence. So the mere fact that transitional fossils exist is evidence against creationism. This problem is only emphasized when creationists themselves analyze the collection of human transitional fossils to determine which they believe are ape and which are human. Creationism would not predict the existence of human transitional fossils at all, but one thing it would predict is that humans, being a special creation, should be easy to tell apart from all other species. And yet, when creationists evaluate the line of increasingly human-like fossils, they can't even agree among themselves where the dividing line between human and non-human lie. What could be a better indicator that a species is transitional than that? Two of the few testable claims made by young earth creationism are that the universe and all life were created by God 6,000 years ago and that the entire earth was drowned in a worldwide flood 4,300 years ago. Apart from the species preserved on Noah's Ark, all animals drowned, many of which were subsequently fossilized. Therefore, creationism predicts that nearly all fossils must be the same age, 4,300 years old, and they must be sorted primarily according to flood dynamics. Evolutionary theory, on the other hand, predicts that fossils should vary in age over a span of hundreds of millions of years, and they must be sorted by lineage according to the evolutionary tree. 
It would thus be completely impossible, for instance, to find human remains in the fossil record before mammals evolved, since humans are a type of mammal and mammals had to evolve before humans could evolve. So how do these predictions compare to the evidence? For starters, since fossils require rapid burial in sediment-filled water, of course many fossils are associated with flooding. But if the fossil record was created by a single worldwide flood, fossils should be all jumbled together, perhaps sorted somewhat by buoyancy or a species' ability to escape rising floodwaters, as some creationists have predicted. So is that what we actually see? Not even close. As you descend through the fossil record, plants and animals generally become simpler and less diverse, and they are associated with ecosystems of other similarly simpler and less diverse species. Furthermore, those species found higher up in the fossil record more closely resemble currently living species found in the same area as the fossils, whereas those species found lower down in the fossil record are increasingly different. Almost all fossils in the lowest levels look nothing like anything alive today. That is exactly what we would expect to find if all species evolved from a simple common ancestor. In fact, evolutionary theory can confidently predict that no one will ever find naturally occurring fossils of birds, mammals, dinosaurs, reptiles, or amphibians among the many fossils in the ancient Cambrian rocks, since none of those animals evolved until more than a hundred million years after the Cambrian formed. Sure enough, no such fossils have ever been discovered there. Creationism can't account for any of that, nor can it make any equally specific, detailed predictions because the fossil record is simply not sorted by flood dynamics. As for determining the age of fossils, there are currently well over 40 different radiometric dating methods in use. Using appropriate, uncontaminated samples, most of these techniques are accurate to within just a 2% margin of error, and the accuracy only increases by using multiple samples and multiple dating methods to verify the results. When these techniques are used to test the ages of fossil samples, the results revealed that life began approximately 3.9 billion years ago, multicellular life 900 million years ago, a wide variety of body types 540 million years ago, land plants 465 million years ago, land vertebrates 397 million years ago, reptiles 310 million years ago, dinosaurs 230 million years ago, mammals 200 million years ago, birds 150 million years ago, the dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago. Humans and chimpanzees last shared a common ancestor 7 million years ago. And modern humans appeared 200,000 years ago. These results closely match the evolutionary tree and they make sense only in the context of evolution. They are clearly far older than the 4300 year or even 6000 year creationist timelines. And they make no sense if all life was specially created at the same time. Creationists often point to the wide variety of life appearing suddenly in the fossil record during the Cambrian period, the Cambrian explosion as it's called, as evidence that life suddenly appeared all at once, as the creationist model claims. But there are a few problems with this. First, more primitive life existed for billions of years before the Cambrian explosion began, but hard parts suitable for fossilization hadn't evolved yet. Second, the Cambrian explosion took place over a period of 20 to 25 million years. That's quite rapid in evolutionary terms, but completely incompatible with the creationist claim of a mere 6,000-year-old Earth and a seven-day creation. Third, the species that appear in the Cambrian bear virtually no resemblance to any species living today. All of them are extinct. That too is incompatible with creationism. But it makes sense if most of them died out, but some evolved dramatically over hundreds of millions of years into the species we see today. Creationists, of course, question the accuracy of radiometric dating. However, when multiple different radiometric techniques are correctly applied to samples from the same geological layers, they all result in similar dates. Plus, there are many non-radiometric dating techniques that also indicate a far more ancient Earth than creationists claim. The oldest living tree is over 5,000 years old, and matching its tree rings with older dead trees creates an unbroken line of tree growth going back almost 14,000 years. That alone contradicts the claim of a 6,000-year-old Earth, but it gets worse. 
Mitochondrial and chromosomal evidence shows that the most recent woman from whom all current women descended in an unbroken line lived somewhere between 99,000 and 234,000 years ago, and the man from whom all current men descended in an unbroken line lived somewhere between 120,000 and 581,000 years ago. They were each part of existing populations when they lived, and it's virtually certain they never met. Antarctica has up to 800,000 layers of yearly snow growth deposited on its permanent ice sheets. Gypsum crystals form exceedingly slowly, and the largest gypsum megacrystals in Mexico could not have formed in less than one million years. The Green River basins in Colorado, Wyoming, and Utah have up to six million layers of yearly sedimentation deposits. Limestone stalactites form at a rate of only four inches per thousand years, meaning the 60-foot-plus stalactites we've discovered must be at least 180,000 years old, but the limestone caves in which they grew would have required tens of millions of years to form. The Americas and Africa are moving apart at a rate of a few inches per year, and both their current distance apart and the distribution of fossils found on both continents indicate they were last in contact 200 million years ago. Tidal friction slows the Earth's rotation by 2 seconds per 100,000 years, which means that 380 million years ago, the days should have been 22 hours long with 400 days in the year. Corals can be used to test this because they produce both daily and annual growth rings, which can be counted to determine how many days there were in a year for corals radiometrically dated at 380 million years old. And the answer is also 400 day years. So, as you can see, we have multiple dating techniques that can be cross-checked to verify the accuracy of radiometric dating. 